We're going to start 2D motion, but really the emphasis is going to be about vectors. We're still working with vectors. We're not going to abandon them. 2D motion is kind of a mix of one-dimensional motion, which you did without vectors, and now adding vectors to that mix. And that's what we have to think about 2D motion. Um, does anybody know what this picture is? You're all one of them. What is the UCR, uh, what do we call ourselves here? Islanders. This is actually a very, very old print of an islander. Do you see what this guy's holding? You know what those are called? What is it? Oh, these are Scottish hammers. Has anyone heard the hammer throw? What's the hammer throw? Anybody do the hammer throw? There are athletes on campus who do it. Okay, here's the hammer throw. Let me show you. We're going to study this today in kind of gory detail. The modern hammer throw has something like this. It's a big metal ball instead of this, this kind of bouncing ball. It's a big metal sphere. And it's attached to a chain. In the old days, it was actually more like a hammer. It was a solid rod with this big heavy weight on top. I'll show you some videos in a minute, but here's the basic picture. Okay? These very strong men and women, now all can be Olympic, these are Olympic level athletes. They basically take this ball and in a very complicated way, I'm not going to do it in a complicated way because it's very elegant and beautiful and challenging. I will, I will die if I try it. What they do is they basically spin this ball around, okay? And it goes faster and faster and faster, and they let it go at, at a specific point to make it go as far as possible, right? When you see them do it, this thing's revolving at a fantastic speed, okay? So you have to ask yourself, here's what we're going to play with. Over the next hour, we're going to try to answer the question, how do you get really good at this, this hammer toss, right? I mean, there's a lot of athletics in it, there's a lot of biology in it. We're going to look at it as a physics problem. How do I throw it really far? What do I have to do? How do I quantify how fast I have to spin this thing? And how can I win this competition? And when I show you the videos, it's outrageous how far they throw these giant metal spheres. It's, it's somewhat unbelievable. Okay. So, but before we do that, we have a lot to cover today. We're going to do a lot of demonstrations to try to build up to that. Um, typically on Fridays, that's how it's going to operate. We're going to do more kind of experimental stuff on Fridays mixed with our, our basic ideas. Okay. So before we go, let's just do one review question on your own. You should see this right now. And it's a question just from last lecture. Which vector shows the direction and magnitude of the average acceleration? So there's v2 is the final velocity, v1 is the initial velocity. And the question is, which vector, vector shows the direction and magnitude of the average acceleration? Okay, go ahead and take about 30 more seconds. Now be careful what the question is asking. I'm showing you velocity vectors. I'm asking about what? Acceleration, okay? So be very, very careful. Acceleration is the change in the velocity vector divided by time. Which direction is the acceleration? You have four choices and one is if you don't believe any of those choices. <coughs> Okay, so take about 10 more seconds. I see about 100-ish responses. There's coming some more. I'm going to pause this. Wait. It's not going to tell you yet what I'm seeing. It's promising. If I throw an object to a trajectory, a trajectory like this, right? I did this about five times last lecture. Right? What's the shape of that trajectory? It's a parabola. Okay? We're going to learn how to plot parabolas. Here's a parabola. There's that shape. The, we talked about this. The velocity at every point is tangent to the trajectory. Right? Which direction was the acceleration in this problem? I'll give you 20 more seconds. We talked a lot about this. When I think of that ball being thrown through the sky, which direction was the acceleration? So 10 more seconds. Okay, three, two, one. 
Okay, good. I had some converts. And this is what I was hoping. It looks like now most of you, so again, 85% of you said that it was D now. Okay, that's good. But what I saw at the beginning was that a lot of you said that it was this arrow to the right. Okay? And that shrunk by about half. That was something like 20%. It went down to 12, 13%. In these types of problems, you have many different pieces of information that you can draw from. One is, we said that when I think of free fall, when I throw that ball through the par parabolic trajectory, I know the acceleration is always down. What about the rocket problem? When we shot the rocket up, it ran out of fuel. Which direction was the acceleration? Always down. And what was the magnitude of that acceleration? 9.8 meters per second squared. So that's one piece of information that you know from hearing about. The other way to do this is to take the difference of those vectors. If I take v2 minus v1, v1 would be pointed the opposite direction, down like this. The sum of those two would point down. Okay? That's a totally separate way of solving the problem. So the answer in the end is, in fact, d, the acceleration is down. But you see that there's many different ways of approaching the problem. You could take the vector sum divided by delta t, or you could recall that that's how free fall motion works. Let's move on. Here's what we're going to work through today. We're going to explore more about vectors um, in uniform circular motion. So we're kind of thinking about another simplification. This one is weird because circular motion a lot of you have heard of or seen before. And there are a lot of misconceptions that we have to be careful about. Um, and we're going to use these vectors along with the expression for 2D, mo 2D motion projectile motion, basically how projectiles fly, to find the maximum range Ideal projectile. Okay? You see that this is basically the hammer toss, right? I need to spin the hammer around in a circle, I need to let it go at the right angle, and I'm going to ask how far I can launch it. So we're going to work through uh, some uh, a physics Olympiad. Okay. Let's do one more problem just to see if we can address this. Here's the uniform circular motion. It's basically the same thing that we did with this hammer throw. There should be it's a very simple motion, and that's why we study it, because it has some interesting and simplifications that we can take advantage of. Uniform circular motion is one in which I keep the speed of the ball moving the same at all times. You see that? That I'm just letting this ball spin at the same speed. If I slow it down, that means there's an angular acceleration. We'll do that basically week seven. Right? We won't touch that until later. If I speed it up, there's an acceleration. It's not uniform. If I keep it at the same speed, this is uniform circular motion. Okay? So I can take two points. Again, this is not a parabolic trajectory. This trajectory is now circular. And I can take two points and do some of the same analysis that we've been doing. So I can say, here's the velocity at time t. Again, what do we say about the velocity vector relative to the trajectory? It's always what? Tangent to the trajectory, right? So here's my velocity vector, tangent to the trajectory. Now wait. Remember this, because I guarantee by next lecture you'll always, always forget it. The velocity vector is always what to the trajectory? Tangent. Always. I'll show you many places where we lose track of that. Here's the, the velocity of t plus delta t, and we can determine the acceleration. This is what we just said. If I take delta v, the change in the vector velocity, so both magnitude and direction, divided by time, that gives me my acceleration. So let's see if we can now, now we have a new piece of physics, but questions that we know how to answer. According to this diagram, the change in velocity is in which direction? Okay, you have the velocity vectors, and now all you're asked is which direction does it change? Uh, go ahead, take one minute. On your own, get on your own. So the change in velocity is v final minus v initial. That gives us our acceleration direction. So about 30 more seconds. Just draw, work it out on your paper. Still about 30-ish. 
You're doing pretty good so far. Yeah, let me stop it. You got three more seconds. Put something in. Go, 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 go. Okay, here's what I got. 75%, 76% of you said the answer was C, which is exactly right. Okay? Do you see that this is the same problem over and over again? We've seen this same vector sum over and over again. What, is, what do we know? Is anybody familiar? Who has heard of circular motion from high school physics? Yeah, a couple, a handful. What do we know from the people that have done it before? What do we say about circular motion? Which direction is the acceleration in this problem? I heard it. Always toward the center, right? In uniform circular motion, the acceleration is always towards the center. How else do I keep that ball from not just road being thrown out to space, right? I need something to accelerate it inward. What's this acceleration called? There are two words. They often get mixed up. One of them's a fake force. The other one's a real one. <laughs> Who's heard of centrifugal force? That's the fake one. <laughs> Throw that out from your brain forever, OK? The real one is called centripetal force. The centripetal acceleration or the centripetal force is what keeps this thing accelerated towards the center. Centrifugal force is basically a sum of forces that people say is what draws it out to the edge of the circle. It turns out it's a fake force. And we'll explain why when we get to Newton's laws. So when you hear of a centripetal force, you should call that on somebody and say, that's not a real force. If you hear them say centripetal, it's good. We're going to study this more in Newton's law. But the point that I need you to see is that in this diagram, I've taken an arc of a circle. The acceleration was always towards the center. You see that if I rotated that diagram to the side, it's still circular motion. Which direction would the acceleration be? Always towards the center. Okay? In uniform circular motion, the acceleration is always toward the center. I'm going to pose this next question. This one is very hard, and I'm not even going to expect you to answer it at your desk. It's actually very tricky. But I'm going to work it out for you. Here's a question that you can ask. This is how we derive an understanding of circular motion. According to these diagrams, which of these expressions are true? There's four really complicated expressions. Okay? I want to work this out. I want, to, I want us to understand the circular motion really carefully. So let's see if we can just solve this problem using what we know on the board. So here's what we have. I'm not going to redraw the diagram. We're going to work with that diagram, but you have it there. Okay? Here's what we know about everything so far, about this motion, but also about our background that we've learned so far. Let's get this in focus. It's good. OK, here's what we know. The magnitude of the velocity at time t, how does that magnitude compare at time t plus delta t? Is it bigger than, less than, or equal to? What did we say about uniform circular motion? The speed is constant, right? That means the magnitude of the velocity vector, meaning the length of the velocity vector at v of t is exactly the same as it is at t plus delta t. The speed in uniform circular motion remains constant. Okay, That's one thing we can get. The second thing we can get is this thing called the acceleration that we call the centripetal acceleration. Which direction is it directed? Forward the? Yes, good. Okay? So the centripetal acceleration is what's pulling that ball in towards the center of the circle. Right? It's, a, it's a, an acceleration that's steering the ball into this circle. We know a third thing, which is our definition of speed. It's the magnitude of the change in displacement. Right? Remember we did this, r final minus r initial over time is basically the, the speed. And we know that the acceleration, again, these aren't vectors. These are scalars the way I'm writing them, so keep that careful in your notes. The acceleration is the magnitude of the change in velocity. Right, so these are all just things that we've seen so far. We've done all of this before. None of that is new. We're just applying it to this, this new geometry, right? this circular motion. So here's what I'm going to ask. How can we determine? 
the acceleration, the magnitude of the acceleration vector. Right? So how do we, this, basically what I want to get to is how do we quantify the centripetal acceleration? Does anybody remember what the centripetal acceleration is equal to in terms of velocity and radius? Right? This is another one that people often remember for some weird reason. Okay, we'll derive it. If you don't know it, that's good. It'll make our job actually easier. So first what we're going to do is look at this circle. And we're going to find the magnitude of the vector delta r. Right? And we, did, we did a lot of this. On, on Monday, Wednesday, we've been working with this before. So I'm going to redraw these vectors. We know exactly what these look like in the picture. I have one vector pointed this way. These are now position. Right? So here's r of t and r of t plus delta t. Here's the angle theta. Right? So this is just drawn, if you look at the picture in the middle screen, you see that these are the displacements from the center. They're just two vectors, displaced from the center, spread, spread by this angle theta. And we know the length of these vectors is just r. Right? That's the radius of the circle. Which direction is delta r? You've seen this question probably four times. Which direction is r final minus r initial? In that diagram I've just shown. R of t plus delta t plus a negative R of t. Negative R of t is this way. What's the vector sum of the two? It points to the right. Okay. If you don't see this, go back to yesterday and the day before. Here, let me draw it really quickly. Here's R final. I'll call it R final. Minus or plus a negative R initial. And when I add them, I go from where I started to where I ended. Okay? We've seen that problem several times before. So now we have this thing. I can write delta r is equal to r final minus r initial. And this is equal to, just like we said, r of t plus delta t minus r of t. Okay? So everyone's clear on that. Right? Vector addition, two displacement vectors forms a triangle that has one angle, theta, and then two other angles that are identical, which we don't really know. Now, let's do the second step. And we're going to find delta v, because that's what we need for acceleration. Okay, So there's that, that triangle from the position. Let's see if we can do the same for delta v. Which direction is v of t pointed? In this diagram, v of t is up and to the right, okay? So I can draw that. I'm actually gonna draw it slightly different in a second. Here's V of t plus delta t, right? Which direction was V of t pointed? Up and to the right, so I'm gonna draw it over here. Just like Samantha said last time, she said draw those two vectors. You're gonna remember Samantha on exam one, because you're gonna be like, wait, Samantha had a rule, and if I do the rule, I get it right, okay? So there are my two vectors. If I take V of t final, V of t plus delta t, so V final minus V initial, I flip the sign of V of t, it looks like this, and then I take their vector addition. This is V of t, this is delta t. Okay? Same thing we've been doing over and over again, just applying it to different places. Now, here's what some, a lot of people are asking about this at, at office hours. I think the TAs are talking about it, the SIs will be talking about it. These two triangles are what we call similar triangles. Right? They have exactly the same characteristics. They share this angle theta. The other two angles that make up the triangle, even though we don't know those angles, are identical. Right? These are similar triangles. So the ratios of the sides between the two triangles can be related. They're directly related. They might have different sizes, but we can look at them as similar triangles. And you'll see some of these rules uh, in your homework on Sunday night. Okay? So if I have similar triangles, I can write down some geometric statements. If I take the length delta v, so you see that in this vector right here. The length of that vector relative to the length of the side of that triangle, right here, 
Do you see that that has to be the same? It's a similar triangle. If I go up to my top triangle, I can write delta R divided by basically capital R. Do you see that those two triangles, the ratio of those two sides on one triangle is equal to the ratio of those two sides on the other triangle? This is something you're going to have to practice. You'll work with it in the discussion sections. Yeah? Where did you get the image? I'm sorry, no, the dimension. Yeah? This is basically just the length of these two vectors. Remember we said that the displacement was the same? The velocities are also the same, right? So it's just the length of, of this vector. And I will even, I can write that more carefully to make it clear that these are all scalars, okay? So the ratio of this to the side on that triangle is equal to this thing on to the side of that triangle, which is just r, okay? Now if I use our definition that delta r is equal to v delta t, which again you've seen, velocity is displacement over time, I can write down a very compact expression. I'm going to write delta v over delta t equals v squared over r. It just comes from, if you do the algebra between these two equations, what you'll get is this. What is delta v over delta t? What do we call a change in velocity over a change in time? Acceleration. Right? So in this problem, we have an acceleration that we're going to call the centripetal acceleration. And it comes out to v squared over r. Okay? Let's just think about what that means. If I have a ball spinning in a circle, and I go faster and faster and faster, what happens to that acceleration? The centripetal acceleration has to get, look at the equation, V gets bigger, A gets bigger, okay? If the radius gets smaller, and I want to keep this thing going really fast, try this at home, it gets really hard to hold. I have to fight back against that acceleration. So the acceleration to pull this ball towards the center, which we call the centripetal acceleration, is bigger when I have a bigger velocity, so I'm spinning it faster, or I have a smaller radius, okay? Do you see that? That's called the centripetal acceleration. We're gonna work a lot with this as we move on. You'll see it again when we start talking about forces, but we just basically derived from some very simple geometries, the geometries of similar triangles, this expression. The centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. So if you wanna throw a hammer, right, this is what it says, I want my velocity to be big, right? I want to throw this, this, this hammer as fast as possible. And from this expression, V is basically the centripetal acceleration times R. I want a bigger radius and a bigger acceleration. If I can accelerate that ball towards the center really, really fast, basically drawing it towards the center, and I can make that circle radius bigger and bigger, the larger my velocity will be. Okay, I, you all knew this answer, and I'm going to ask it again just to double check. If I throw a projectile, I'll call this plus x, this plus y. Just from our intuition, what angle do I want to throw the projectile to make it go as far as possible? Roughly 45. We'll see what that angle really should be. But we all have an intuition that this angle should be 45 degrees, right? So if I'm throwing this hammer, I want my velocity vector from the throw to be at 45 degrees, and I want it to be as big as possible. The way to make it really big is to spin it around really fast, really far away. Okay? Let me show you what this looks like. We want it to be at a large radius, that's why you put it at the end of a chain, and you launch it. Okay? So let's keep going. Here's a... a if you don't know who Ted Diesel is, does anybody know that? Nobody. Who wrote the Lorax? Dr. Seuss. That's his real name. Anyway, Dr. Seuss said in the Lorax, they just kept vigoring and vigoring and vigoring. This, the Lorax is basically the story of L.A. So if you want a little bit of L.A. history, go read the Lorax. Uh, you, you'll see why. It actually was. Dr. Seuss wrote this about the LA metropolitan area without telling people that. 
Okay, so let's move on. We have another part of this, and it's this part. So check it out. So what we have to do, we spin this ball around. We got that part figured out. The next part is how do we throw it, and how do we know how far we can get? Right? How do exactly what do we need to do physically to get this thing to be launched as far as, as that athlete can throw? Okay? And we talked about this last time. When you're doing your homework, have this slide in front of you. When we talk about 2D projectiles, this is we already know this, right? In the X direction, once I've let go of that ball, the speed is no longer going to change, right? I'm accelerating it. When I throw it, I'm accelerating it. But once I let go, there's no more velocity in the X direction, unless there's wind resistance, which we're ignoring, okay? So in this problem, we say that the acceleration in the X direction is zero. But the acceleration in the Y direction is just what we've been talking about. It's down, and it's due to gravity. So it's 9.8 meters per second squared. If you take that, you can derive that the initial velocity, so this v naught, has two components. Remember, we've been talking about this now. Everybody's seen it in the discussion section. There might be one more discussion section. If you haven't seen it, you will. You take the vector components of this velocity. One of them is cosine theta. That gives you the x direction. One of them is sine theta. That gives you the y direction. And we want to find out eventually what angle should that be to get the maximum parabolic trajectory, right? That's the problem we're after. Now, finally, you get to these equations for the displacement, so the x and y displacement. Remember we said they were separate, right? They don't, they, they don't interact with each other. The motion in the x direction cares nothing about what's going on in the y direction. We'll see many examples of this today. The y direction, you have the initial height of that hammer toss, right? So it's not thrown from the ground, he's not kicking it, he's actually throwing it from about waist height. And then you have the initial velocity times the time, and then you have this term that comes from the fact that there's a downward acceleration. So you've worked with this. These are two one-dimensional motion equations, right? You've solved lots of these problems by now. Uh, here's the key, is that the vertical and horizontal motions run independently but simultaneously. Okay? Can I have a volunteer who knows how to do one thing? All you have to be able to do is throw a ball straight up. Not forward, not over your shoulder, just straight up. You want to go? Okay. <laughs> up on this chair. I'll be right back. I think last time we even knew 
basically what you're going to see. What's the trajectory of that ball going to look like? I hear what? Well, to her, what does it look like? Straight up. What's it going to look like to you as an outside observer? I saw it. I see people doing this. Right? What is that called? It's a parabola. You see that two-dimensional motion can be completely separated. There's me doing the x-direction motion. There's her doing the y-direction motion. But to an outside observer, it looks like two. The mathematics, the physics is identical to two-dimensional motion. Let's see if we can do it. Okay, here's the trick. You're going to do it really fast. No, no, not that fast. Don't throw it right away. That you get up to speed. Get ready to watch. Okay, good. So this is the point. I want to thank you. What was your name? Leanne. Leanne. Everybody thank Leanne. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, Leanne. Okay. We're going to have many, many examples of this that we're going to talk about today. You're going to see. This is the thing to remember, that in this two-dimensional motion, it separates into the x and y direction. Okay? If I break down the velocity, again, in this picture, that velocity is separated into x component, y component. Every other vector in this whole entire situation, whatever it is, in this case it's throwing a hammer, in one case it's her throwing the softball up and catching it. If I separate all of the x components, they are distinct from all of the y components. And they run independently but simultaneously. Okay? That's the key to remembering how to do these problems. So we brought on the chair. Good. Okay? Let's do an example. I want to solve something. Because that was kind of maybe you could see what's going on, but let's make sure we can actually solve a problem where we use this idea. Everybody see the problem? Good. <clears throat> This is a really typical exam problem, right? There's no number in this problem, right? There's one, there's a zero, and we label the sphere one and two, right? There's very little information in the problem, but there's clearly a story, okay? And the question is actually pretty straightforward. Which of these hits the ground first? Here's the way it might look on an exam, is sphere one, Sphere 2, they both hit at the same time, not enough information to tell. You see that that's an easy multiple choice exam question. Okay? But is it easy to solve? Usually not. So let's do it really carefully. First of all, what do we always do when we are sitting at the exam and there's steam coming out of our ears and we read this problem? What is the first thing that I want you to do every problem? Draw. Draw. Good. Draw and imagine what the heck the thing is talking about. Okay? So let's do that. I'm going to be pretty advanced and draw a coordinate system. You don't have to do that first. That can come after you actually think about it. Here's the floor. Okay. Everybody sees that? Good. I'm just going to draw sphere one. I'll give a little bit of space. Sphere two. And the question says, Two metal spheres are simultaneously released and undergo two e three fall. At t equals zero, sphere one has an initial velocity in the negative x direction. So we're going to call left negative x. And sphere two simply just drops. Okay? So the first thing we do is maybe draw what those, what the paths they would travel would look like. Right? What's going to happen to sphere two? That one's easy. It's going to go straight down. Right? Okay? What's going to happen to sphere 2? If I push it straight out to the side, what's the trajectory going to look like? What's that trajectory called? Um, it's a parabola, but it's just half of it. Right? So it's completely identical to what we've been talking about. It's that it's going to travel through a parabola that falls to the floor. Okay? Remember what we said. If I had a parabolic trajectory, the velocity is what to the trajectory? Tangent. Tangent. Do you see that this is just half a parabolic problem? It's the same problem we did when I threw the ball up and over. The velocity is always tangent. I'm just saying there's a velocity right at the top, and it kicks it down to the side. So the velocity is in this direction, and I'm going to call it v0 because it's the beginning, and x 
because it's in the x-axis. That ball's only being pushed in the x-direction. I'm not shooting it down, I'm not shooting it up, I'm just shooting it to the side. Now, which direction is the acceleration in this problem? Down. down. Good. Okay. One point on your exam. Good. Okay. Here's what happens. Here's the motion diagram. Again, we've seen these types of things before. They get longer and longer until finally they smash. In my drawing, smash. Okay. So I've drawn here vectors between each time point, and we have to now write down some basics. So for both of these, a of x is equal to 0, a of y of t is equal to minus g. Just like we said in that equation bank when I showed that slide, same thing. There's a negative acceleration in the y direction, no acceleration in the x direction. So now I'm going to do the math. Okay, so hold, hold on to this picture in your mind. We're going to set it aside for a second. And we're just going to start writing down the math for sphere 1 and the math for sphere 2. Okay? So here's what we got. Sphere 1 is the one that's got an x velocity. I'm going to do sphere 2 first because it's only in the y direction. But that one seems easier to me. So for sphere 2, I have no velocity in the x direction, only in the y direction. My y direction velocity is just the initial component minus gt. This is just 1d kinematics. What's the initial velocity of the ball that's just being drawn? Yeah, zero. Good. Get rid of that. Okay. Now I go to my other kinematics equations. y of t equals y zero, so y final minus y initial, plus v not y t minus one half g t squared. Again, this term is zero because I have no initial y velocity. And I can write this down as y of t minus y of zero equals one half g t squared. Okay? You see that? That's just basic in that. The change in, in the height is just one half g t squared, it's down, so a negative sign. Now let's compare it to the other one, it's more complicated. I mean, the other thing we can do is just for completion. What happens in the x direction? Does it ever go anywhere in the x direction? No, it's zero. Let's do sphere one. Same basic recipe, same equations. Start off with the x velocity. That's equal to vx, and it's negative, right? We kick the thing to the left. I then look at the velocity in the y direction. It's v naught minus gt. I still have gravity, right? So gravity is still the acceleration in the y direction. What's the initial y velocity for the sphere that's going to kick to the side? Zero. Again, it makes our life easy. I then use kinematics, y of t equals y naught plus v naught by t minus one half g t squared. We said that the y velocity is zero, and I get y of t minus y naught equals minus one half g t squared. Look at this. If I circle this equation that tells me about the displacement versus time for the one that just gets dropped, and I circle this equation, or square this equation, for the displacement in the y direction as a function of time, what does kinematics tell us? They're identical. So for the same amount of time falling, even if it gets kicked out to the side, for the same amount of time, are they going to hit one before the other or at the same time? Same exact time. So kinematics seems to tell us that it's the same time. The only difference is in the x direction. In this one, it's going to displace in the x direction by some amount, proportional to that velocity and how much time it travels. The other one didn't do anything, right? It's not going to displace in the x direction. So this tells us two things. One, it says they're going to hit at the same time, and we're going to test it in a second. The other one is that these two motions, x and y, are completely independent. So independent, in fact, that both of these two spheres, if they're launched at the same time, they go exactly the same distance in y, even though one got kicked out to the side. Right? Its trajectory, the length it traveled total, is longer, but the time it takes is the same. 
So here's how we do this. This little thing is basically two metal marbles. One of them, this one on your right, when I flip this little trigger, it's just going to drop. Okay? It's just a little rod. There's a marble. I pull the rod out. Okay? When it hits the ground, it's going to fall into the metal pan, so you'll hear it. Okay? The other one, there's a little pusher that knocks it off the cliff. Did you ever hear of uh, Tommy Caldwell? You know who this is? Okay, look it up. He's an elite rock climber. He was actually captured, I think in Jordan, somewhere. He was captured by basically people who wanted to take him for ransom. He pushed the guy off the cliff, saved the whole group of people he's with. He's a very famous rock climber, Tommy Caldwell. Look it up. So here's the marble that is the captor. Uh, Tommy Caldwell's this little rod that's going to knock him off the cliff. So watch, this, do, it, do it this time. Close your eyes and just listen to see if you hear two big metal bangs at the same time, or if you hear ting, ting, because that would tell us we're wrong. If you hear two bangs at two different times, that means kinematics is off. Okay? Doesn't work. Newton was wrong. Or I pulled this wrong and I messed up the whole experiment. Ready? Eyes closed. Did you hear? They hit identical in time. Boom, boom. Let's listen one more time. This time you can watch. I think some of you are cheating. I saw your eyes open. This time I'll allow you to put your eyes open. That's fine. Okay, let's listen and watch at the same time. Okay. The motions are independent, simultaneous. Even though this one went further total arc length, the time it took to get to the bottom of the Are you convinced? At least a little bit? OK, let me show you one more example to wrap up. Here's the, here's the slide that will help us through our homework. But let me show you this one more example. It's very famous, actually. In your, in your problems, there might even come up in your problems about shooting a monkey out of a tree. Did you get this problem yet? I don't condone shooting monkeys, so I'm not going to call it that. But here's the idea, OK? I have. A little cannon that basically shoots a metal marble out of a pipe. The way it does it, let's see if there's anything in there. Nothing in there. I turn on the air, it's actually pretty dangerous. Okay, that's why you're about 12 feet back. That marble shoots out of there very, very fast. We get measured, we'll talk about how fast it goes next time. What it does is it shoots out of there. As soon as it passes through the end of that drill, there's a little sensor that tells that little electromagnet up at the top to let go. Okay? So imagine, here's my, traject my projectile. Here, I put a little piece of wood hanging. Okay? If these motions run simultaneously but separately, this thing, when that electromagnet drops, this thing's going to drop and go through pure y-direction kinematics. What's going to happen to this one? If it's going really fast, it's just going to shoot that piece of wood in a straight shot. But what acceleration is being pulled down on this marble? What's the use of gravity? So what it really does is it's going to go through a trajectory that's parabolic. And what's going to happen? Should I be able to hit that piece of wood or not? Right? Absolutely. If I release this at the same time that this is launched, the trajectory goes as this thing drops. No matter where it is, right? No matter how I choose the speed, I can shoot it slow, I can shoot it fast, it's always going to hit that block. Let me see if it works. Here's the scary part. Aim the first. Is it? I wouldn't. Okay. Marble. Yeah, okay, good. The marble's all the way down here. Air comes on, passes a little sensor right here, it tells that block to let go. It's kind of loud for a second, but don't be scared. Ready? Yeah. Okay, that was the fast one. Did it hit it? Good. Let's try it one more time, but a little slower. Let me set that block back up. <laughs> so what's great sin is the immediately sent to my Every morning I just wake up. Okay. Let's see it one more time. I'm going to try to slow it down. 
down. It's so good. Last shot. We've got two minutes to make this work. I think we can do it. Okay. Just, I'm going to try to do it slow. Watch that thing. It's going to drop further, but it should still hit. Did you see it? Did you catch it? The thing dropped about a meter. It still hits. No matter what speed I choose, if I know that both the projectile and that block are falling due to what acceleration? Gravity. It doesn't matter. I will always hit the block. Okay? You're going to see this problem somewhere in the future, probably on the exam or if not in the homework. When we come back, we're going to talk about, we'll okay, finish this is the last bit about throwing a hammer. How do we throw it as far as possible? You see how we're there? We're almost there. One more step and we'll do it. We'll do it right at the next time. Have a good weekend. Thank <laughs> you.